Forty Thousand Miles Over Land and Water by Ethel Gwendolyn Vincent. Chapter One Across the Atlantic. Latitude forty three degrees fifteen minutes north, longitude fifty degrees twelve minutes west. All is intensely quiet. The revolution even of the screw has ceased. We are wrapped in a fog so dense that we feel almost unable to breathe. We shudder as we look at the white pall drawn closely around us. The decks and rigging are dripping, and everything on board is saturated with moisture. We feel strangely alone. When, hark, a discordant screech, a hideous howl belches forth into the still air to be immediately smothered and lost in the fog. It is the warning cry of the foghorn. We are on board the White Star Streamer, Germanic, in mid-Atlantic, not far off the great ice banks of Newfoundland. It was on Wednesday, the 2nd of July, that we left London, and embarked from Liverpool on the 3rd. I need not describe the previous bustle of preparation, the farewells to be gone through for a long absence of nine months, the little crowd of kind friends who came to see us off at Euston, nor our embarkation and our last view of England. I remember how dull and gloomy that first evening on board closed in, and how a slight feeling of depression was not absent from us. The next morning we were anchoring in Queenstown Harbor, and whilst waiting for the arrival of the mails in the afternoon, we went by train to Cork. The mails were on board the Germanic by four o'clock. We weighed anchor, and our voyage to America had commenced. The often advertised quick passages across the Atlantic are only reckoned to and from Queenstown. The seasick traveler hardly sees the point of this computation of time, for the coasts of Old Ireland are as stormy and of as much account as the remainder of the passage. And now we have settled down into the usual idle life on board ship, a life where eating and drinking plays the most important part. There is a superfluity of concerts and literary entertainments, the proceeds in one instance being devoted to the aid of a poor electrical engineer who has had his arm fearfully torn in the machinery, and whose life was only saved by the presence of mind of a comrade in cutting the strap. Fine weather again at last, for we are past the banks so prolific in storms and fog. The story goes that a certain captain, much harassed by the questioning of a passenger, who asked him if it was always rough here, replied, How should I know, sir? I don't live here. We are nearing America and may hope to land tomorrow. The advent of the pilot is always an exciting event. There was a lottery for his number and much betting upon the foot with which he would first step on deck. A boat came in sight early in the afternoon. There was general excitement, but the captain refused this pilot as he had previously nearly lost one of the company ships. At this, he stood up in his dinghy and fiercely denounced us as we swept onwards, little heeding. Another pilot came on board soon afterwards, but the news and papers he brought us were very stale. These pilots have a very hard life. Working in firms of two or three, they often go out 500 miles in their cutters and lie about for days waiting to pick up vessels coming into port. The fee varies according to the draft of the ship, but often exceeds 30 pounds. At two o'clock, a white line of surf is seen on the horizon. Land, we know, is behind, and great is the joy of all on board. We watched and waited till behind the white line appears a dark one, which grew and grew, until Long Island and Fire Island Lighthouse are plainly visible. Three hours more and we see the beautiful highlands of the Navasink on the New Jersey shore, and then the long sandy plain with the lighthouse which marks the entrance, and we cross the bar of Sandy Hook. As we do so, the sunset gun goes off and tells us that we must pass yet another night on board, for it closes the day of the Officer of Health. We pass the quarantine station, a white house on a lonely rock, then entering the Narrows, anchor in the dusk, off lovely Staten Island. The lights of Manhattan and New Brighton Beach twinkle in the darkness. Steamers with flashing signals ply swiftly backwards and forwards. A line of electricity marks the beautiful span of Brooklyn Bridge, and overall a storm is gathering, making the surrounding hills resound with the cannon of its thunder and the sky bright with sheets of lightning. And so we pass the night, within sight of the lights of New York, with pleasurable excitement, looking forward to our first impressions on the morrow. Sunday, July 13th. By six o'clock, all is life on board the Germanic, for a great steamer takes some time getting underway. Breakfast is a general scramble, 
interspersed with declarations of the revenue officials who are sitting in the saloon. We passed the old fort on Governor's Island, now the military station, in our upward progress, see the round tower of Castle Garden, the emigrants' depot, and by eight o'clock are safely moored alongside the company's pier. On the wharf are presently to be seen passengers sitting forlorn on their trunks, awaiting the terrible inspection of the custom house officer. The one detailed to us showed signs of becoming offensive, being unwilling to believe the statement that a dress some six months old was not being taken round the world for sale. But on making representations to his superior, we were able to throw the things back into the boxes and express them to the hotel. End of chapter one.